What do we have outside? Um, I will try to, to make it entertaining. I must admit that this first lecture will be kind of heavy on, on uh, theory because we want to understand a little bit what's behind these strongly attracting fermions that I will talk about. And so we have to go through a little bit of, of many body physics, actually a wonderful piece of many body physics, namely BCS uh, superfluidity. So uh, I will talk about uh, what happens in a puff of gas a million times thinner than air, um, a gas which, is, uh, which consists of fermions. We will, of course, discuss all the properties of fermions and how they are distinguished from our friends the bosons. And in that gas, these fermions will turn to, uh, will, uh, will pair up, the red and blue guys here, and uh, form, in fact, a superfluid. Um, so first of all, there will be lots of equations and you will be completely like, this is too much. Uh, and, you know, uh, luckily, it's all written up uh, in uh, all kinds of places. Uh, there, there are Verena notes on Fermi gases uh, by Wolfgang Kennerly and myself uh, on the web. There's a uh, Verena uh, note on both Einstein condensation by Wolfgang um, earlier, which describes the methods that we use to actually cool these gases down to pretty much absolute zero. And then, of course, there are uh, other review articles that are very useful by uh, Sandro Svingari, Lev Pitejewski, Stefano Giorgini on the theory of Fermi gases, and then another overview article by Daniel Bloch, Jean Marie Barton, and Zerger. And there is recently, there, there came out a book, Lecture Notes on the BEC BCS crossover in the unitary Fermi gas, which compiles a lot of uh, different. Uh, 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 topics on um, surrounding this unitary Fermi gas that I will talk about. Um, it's edited by Wilhelm Zwerg and came out pretty much by now in Schriner. So that's where you can go to, to, to read up on what I'm uh, going to talk about. Uh, first of all, uh, let's uh, start it with a wonderful cartoon to understand what we are talking about. Um, uh, let's consider indistinguishable particles. As we know, there are two classes in the world, you are also either one of the two. Maybe you're a fermion or you're a boson. To figure that out, you would have to calculate the total number of elementary particles that you consist of, electrons, neutrons, and protons, and see whether it's an odd or an even number. If it's an odd number, you have a half integer spin particle. Those guys we call fermions. They hate each other. They're unsocial. They, uh, for example, this guy's fully asleep. This guy's listening to music, uh, not listening to the others. This guy's probably even spying on the other guys. Uh, this guy up there is Pauli blocking himself. So very antisocial people. Um, turns out, so these guys have to sit in different energy states. And they cannot occupy one of the same energy state. Whereas the, the bosons, those are the sociable particles. We love them. Uh, they have integer spin. And they can share quantum states. And that will lead, even at without any interactions to this remarkable phase transition that Bill told us about yesterday, both Einstein condensation, where they all gather in the ground state of the system. They even help each other, see? They help each other to make it into the ground state that's bosonic stimulation. So that's the, those are the two classes of particles uh, in the universe. So they behave clearly very, very differently. Uh, now, you usually don't see that, uh, that, that particles are fermions or bosons if you work at high temperatures. But at low temperatures, quantum mechanics takes center stage, and we come into trouble, or, or interest, an interesting regime, when the De Broglie wavelength that, that you should associate to the propagation of these particles becomes on the order of the interparticle space. When lambda De Broglie becomes on the order of the density to the minus one third, that's the interparticle space. Uh, then we are in the regime, we enter the regime of degenerate quantum gases. Now, if you want to do that in the lab, unfortunately, uh, well, we, we want really to work with these gases for quite a while, but when they are so dense, well, they would immediately figure out, let's not be a gas at low temperatures, let's be a metal, you know. Only helium would not be a metal at uh, zero temperature. Uh, everything else just collapses into some metal. So we want... Uh, we want to work with these gases for quite a while. That's why we have to work with ultra-dilute gases, uh, smaller than 10 to 15 particles per cubic centimeter. Um, then we have life time on the order of a second. Uh, if we make more and more dilute, we can have a minute or so. Unfortunately, there's a huge price to pay. 
in order to enter this interesting regime where the De Broglie wavelength becomes on the order of the interparticle uh, distance, we can quickly figure out what is the temperature we need to reach that. Well, it's given by that density to the two-thirds power times h bar squared over the mass of the particles, and it turns out it's a microkelvin. So it's ultra cold. So, well, that's why we have to go to ultra room temperatures and uh, uh, use the techniques of, of laser cooling and evaporative cooling to, to get us there. Uh, the good news is that once we did that, and we worked with the Bose gas, like sodium, for example, sodium-23 is a, is a boson, uh, that's enough. They already condense. Once you have reached this degenerate regime, once these waves start to overlap and touch each other, the particles lose their identity, so to speak, and all want to go into this one big quantum mechanical wave. That's the bose eisen condensate. So that's great. Bosons, not so bad. Is that a question? What do you mean by lifetime in this context? Oh, ah, yeah. So when we work with these gases, right, uh, uh, if, if, they're, if they were quite dense, very soon the particles would, would form molecules and larger clusters, and the gas would stop to be stop being a gas, it would actually form a little piece of metal and clonk, end up at the bottom of our vacuum chamber, would hear a little, little sound. Um, so that's not good. That's not really going to happen. I'm really hungry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking about We should tell these people lies. <laughs> well, I hope I was smiling when I said that. <laughs> they don't do clonk. <laughs> but what really happens is you start to form molecules, and they just Which go is away. That? And what's left remains a gas. <laughs> Eventually, they will hit, though, the uh, <laughs> walls of your chamber, right. they will not make a sound. <laughs> it won't form a metal, it will just make, it will just clean, it's self-cleaning, right? It's self-cleaning, yeah. As you accumulate lots and lots on, on the walls of your chamber, it will make a metal film, for sure. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> okay. So, uh, at uh, uh, very high temperatures, as, as I mentioned, uh, we will not see the difference between bosons and fermions. Here's uh, a typical harmonic trap that we love to think about because it has uh, very simple equidistant energy states uh, which are very sparsely populated by the, populated by the atoms at high temperatures. Yeah? So there's no problem with quantum degeneracy because there's a lot, a, a lot of room, there are lots of energy states available for rather few particles per energy state, so it's not a problem with quantum degeneracy. However, once we get to the degenerate regime, that means it's equivalent to saying that the number of uh, available uh, energy states becomes on the order of the number of particles, so phase space gets tight, and, well, in the case of bosons, lots of them decide let's all form a bose einstein condensate in the ground state, whereas fermions start to pile up the Fermi C, as we call it, where the fermions uh, populate, of course, each energy state from the bottom up, and here, of course, it's not at zero temperature, so we have some holes up there, and some guys are a little bit hot still. At zero temperature, this is how it looks like. The bosons would all be in the ground state, whereas the fermions form a Fermi C. That highest energy state here that is occupied, that's called the Fermi energy. Uh, and this actually uh, just this degeneracy temperature that I was telling you about, h bar squared over m, uh, divided by the interparticle distance squared of the particles. It's also uh, pretty much uh, with the prefactor given uh, identical to the critical temperature that you need to make these bosons condense into the ground state. Okay, uh, examples of course for bosons would be well, a uh, hydrogen uh, atom with an electron attached to a proton, that's a boson. Sodium 23, if you count all the electrons, protons, neutrons, turns out it's a boson. Or a pair of lithium 6 2, uh, a pair of lithium 6 atoms, a molecule, lithium-6,2, that will feature in the top, that's why I have it here, that is a boson. On the fermion side, of course, electrons are fermions, which is why the whole Fermi business is, is quite important, because it relates directly to, to how our iPod works. Uh, helium-3, lithium-6, turns out is a fermion, lithium-6, um, has three protons, three electrons, three neutrons, so that's nine, that makes a fermion, and potassium-40 also. Uh, how to measure the temperatures in these gases that we have? Um, we, we already heard about uh, uh, low temperature gases in Bill's lecture. Uh, the simplest way is just to poke a hole in your container of gas. Of course, we have a special container. But in this thought experiment, just poke a hole and you see how quickly these atoms stream out. 
But in, in our article and setting, we have a trapped atomic cloud. We trap these atoms using magnetic fields and sometimes laser fields that hold the atoms in the focus of a laser beam. And we can switch off this trap. That's, that's of course, nice. We can uh, take the plug from our power supply, or we can extinguish the laser beam that held the atoms in place, and uh, expand the gas. And then, of course, we can simply image the shadow of a laser beam going through the atom cloud onto a CCD camera. And then what we see is a rather boring uh, looking shadow image of the cloud, but it will become less boring in a second. Which turns out in 1995, that's what people did. The teams in, in Boulder, Colorado, and uh, at MIT, both the Kennedy's group, they uh, looked at these time of flight absorption pictures. Those show you the, uh, the, the temperature of the cloud simply by looking at how, uh, how large has the cloud uh, been expanded to after a given time of flight. And they saw as they cooled the gas, at some point in the center of the cloud, a dark core appeared. That was the Bose Einstein condensate, where all the atoms decided to form this low energy state, um, the Bose Einstein condensate. Um, surrounded by some thermal guys here, where here it's an even colder gas with less thermals, almost an indistinguishable thermal cloud surround. That's the Bose Einstein condensate. Uh, these, these condensates, of course, uh, are, are wonderful. Uh, they have one, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, that is it. so, so that, that happened in 1995. Uh, uh, it was, um, it became possible to put all these atoms into one and the same macroscopic wave function, say 10 million or so. Yeah. Now, uh, an amazing experiment was in 1997 to actually show that these condensates are in fact described by this one microscopic matter wave that I was talking about. The both einstein condensate was split into two, and then each of these were expanded. And in the expanded region, if, if you do this with two pieces of matter, you expand them, they overlap, you see just twice as much matter in the overlap region than, than everywhere else, so okay, great. But this is not a normal type of matter. This is matter described by the wave function. So if that's the case, you should see beautiful interference fringes in the overlap region of these two quantum mechanical waves. And that's exactly what Wolfgang Kennedy and his team have observed, these beautiful interference fringes where one and one atom actually gives zero uh, in these bright regions. It's really just like a laser beam, uh, if you interfere um, two laser beams and you see a wonderful interference pattern. Now there's another uh, important uh, property of these Bose Einstein condensates, uh, namely that they are superfluid. Uh, superfluidity means flow without friction. And uh, one manifestation of this is that if you take a little spoon and you move it in your superfluid, you don't do it too fast, then you will see that the superfluid actually doesn't care at all about the spoon. Uh, it is not pushed away or does not feel any, any issue with this impurity. It's not dragged along by the spoon. It will just not care. It will not get excited by the presence of the spoon. If you stir it a little bit faster, of course, there is at some point what we call a critical velocity, so that the condensate does get excited. Um, but before you reach that critical velocity, there is flow without any friction. There is no problem having the spoon inside. This was studied at MIT in, in this experiment where a little uh, laser beam was just piercing a hole in the condensate and was slowly dragged up and down in the condensate. And if that was done really slowly, nothing happened. The condensate looked just as pure and beautiful as before. And of course, if they did it more dramatically, then yes, the superfluid did follow, did, uh, was indeed excited, and, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, another property of superfluids is uh, an, an amazing uh, a property under rotation. And I will talk about that more. Turns out superfluids cannot just rotate as a rigid body. Not just like your coffee in the, in the mug, as you rotate it, you might actually uh, develop a little like mini vortex in the center or so, but it will not uh, do what a superfluid does. A superfluid cannot have this, this uh, rigid body flow um, pattern. It has to develop these many, many mini tornadoes, not just one, but many, that actually arrange themselves in a beautiful pattern. So that's something I will come back to 
this is a, a property of these superfluids. And that is actually also related to what happens in superconductors when you switch on a magnetic field, you get magnetic flux lines. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. I just want to go back to the simple picture uh, where we compare bosons and fermions now in an atom trap. Bosons, well, they condense, and we have this very dark shadow in the center of the cloud, maybe surrounded by some uh, uncondensed thermal atoms, so that's this weak shadow surrounding this dark core here. That's this picture. Collins, the, the condensed bosons are all in this uh, ground state. There are some thermal gaps here. If you cool a Fermi gas, for example, lithium-6, it looks, well, yeah, not so interesting, right? It's just one big blob. It's quite a bit larger than what you ex would expect from a uh, Bose-Einstein condensate of, say, lithium-7 atoms, uh, uh, because the atoms are much more energetic. Uh, there are lots of atoms that are at highly, occupied, uh, at highly energetic um, quantum states because they cannot be in the ground state. So it's quite a bit larger than what you would expect from a bose einstein condensate. Now let's just understand how to describe... Oh, sorry, I should take your question. In previous slide, uh, I had a question about... Um, uh, if I manage... Yeah. So it seems like... Yeah, yeah. it seems like there are some fringes. Um, is this <laughs> what you expect from different anxieties? <laughs> yes, yes, or, or is it just an artifact? Terrible, unfortunately. Okay, so it's an experiment, it's not a simulation, unfortunately. So all kinds of problems come into play. Um, one thing that we hate is dust. Yeah. So, so dust scattered off from our imaging laser yeah, that is actually uh, moving around is, is a big problem. Because what do we do? We take a laser beam, shine it onto our atom cloud, and wonderful, that laser beam is getting absorbed where the atom cloud is dense. Great. But now, of course, that, that's not giving us a good picture, because if you have ever taken a picture of a laser beam, if you don't pay good attention, it looks terrible. Like, there are all kinds of fringes and, and dust part and everything. So what do we do? We normalize, of course, that image where the atom cloud has been absorbed by the laser beam by the same image without the atoms. Right? So we normalize those two by each other, and that gives us these nice absorption pictures. But, of course, if between the time that you shine in the light for the first time in the atom cloud, and the time you take this normalization image without the atoms, if at that time the dust particle has moved, you get the fringe. That's terrible. Uh, and there are all kinds of other problems that can, can come into play. I don't even want to go ahead. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's, uh, it's tough to make good images. That's for sure. Okay, um, let's simply understand what the shape of this Fermi cloud would look like. So we have a non-directing Fermi gas, and we want to describe it using, of course, fermi dirac statistics. And let's just do it at zero, uh, first at zero temperature, but this would be the final temperature Fermi-Dirac statistics for uh, fermion at an energy state epsilon, and here is mu, that's the chemical potential of uh, the, the fermions. At zero temperature, this function just boils down to be a step function. Everything below the Fermi energy is occupied. Yes, everything above it is not occupied. Uh, if you take a Fermi gas in a box, then your energy states are simply what we love, h bar squared k squared over 2m, where the momentum k is quantized by, well, the dimensions of your box. Uh, in the box of size L, then you have, uh, if you take periodic boundary conditions, you, you, can, uh, you can have momenta 2 pi over the length of the box times 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Yeah. Now, uh, if we simply want to calculate what is the total number of atoms given a Fermi energy that I tell you, we simply have to integrate over all phase space weighted with the occupation factor, which here simply says that all the guys below the Fermi energy are occupied and all the others are not. That's fairly simple. It's just, that's just an integral over k space with a boundary given by the Fermi momentum. Right? So we can, we can rewrite this. The integral over x doesn't matter because we are in some box. It gives us some volume, so I can divide by that volume to get the density. And that gives us 1 over 2 pi q times the volume of the sphere in k space that has radius kf, where kf is related to the Fermi energy simply like that. The Fermi is h bar squared kf squared over 2m. It's the energy of the last particle that is occupying uh, our trap. 
So that's this guy. Okay, so we have this nice relation between the density and the Fermi momentum, Kf um, uh, cube. Fermi momentum is H by Kf and the Fermi energy. Okay, so that's, uh, that's nice to get a feeling for, for what is Kf. K is just, well, it's just related to the density to the minus one third, which is one over the interparticle space. So that's to give you that Kf is not something weird, it's just roughly one over the interparticle space. <coughs> now we can track that. That was in the box. Let's put it in the chat. Well, uh, we can make our life simple. Um, of course, we could deal with the, the quantized eigenstates in the trap and then integrate those over. Or we could say, uh, let's make a local density approximation. It's a fancy word for just saying that at each point in the trap R, here, locally the Fermi energy is not given by E Fermi, but because you're at some finite potential here, it's E Fermi minus the potential at that point. Right? The local Fermi energy is E Fermi minus the potential at that point. That's very useful. Local Fermi energy is given by this, this expression. Now, if you simply use our result from before, that the density was related to the Fermi uh, uh, momentum Q, now we can just make that spatially dependent, Kf of R, plug in the local Fermi energy, and we get an expression for the density directly from this local density approximation. It's a very quick, simple way to, to get that. And look, it has to go like the local Fermi energy to the 3 halves power, which was going like Kf cubed. Kf is the, uh, the, the, the square root of the Fermi energy. <coughs> and uh, so it has to go like the uh, local Fermi energy to the three <laughs> power. So it will look like this, just a little bit, almost like an inverted parabola, but not quite, it's actually to the three halves power. So now, uh, one problem, or interesting uh, effect with fermions is, um, that bothers, bothers us a lot, is actually that they don't want to be in the same state. That means they don't want to be on top of each other, and so that means they will not collide with each other at low temperatures. That's a problem. If fermions don't want to collide with each other, how are we going to thermalize them and cool them? That's going to be a problem that we have to solve. Um, what does that, uh, why does that come about? Well, we have these fermions, say, all in the very same spin state. They all look red. <laughs> red means spin up, say. <laughs> and, well, if they are at the same point in space, that's not good. We have the same point in space, same uh, spin state, so that's, uh, uh, that is not allowed. Now, of course, we are talking quantum mechanics. I cannot say we are at the given point in space. How well can I know where my particles are? Well, to within the de Broglie wave phase. Yeah? So it turns out this, this fact that the fermions don't see each other, that is only true within this distance given by the de Broglie wave so That's roughly where they, that's roughly the spatial extent uh, within which they see, wait a second, we cannot actually talk to each other. So if I know I have a fermion here, at this point in space, there will be no other fermion of the same spin state within a de Broglie wavelength of that first. So that's maybe sad, on the other hand also very cute. We have a pretty much ideal Fermi gas, an ideal gas without any interactions if we have a spin polarized Fermi gas in our trap. But now, of course, fermions are more interesting than that. Uh, so what is the thing that makes them interesting? Well, interactions. In the end, we have interactions, of course. Of course, they build our universe. They build our atoms, the electrons surrounding the protons and the neutrons that are, of course, tightly packed due to strong forces that uh, make them live inside this atomic nucleus. Uh, we even can go to, to uh, dramatic astronomical uh, sizes and look at this neutron star, which is a collection of neutrons that is packed together densely. Uh, the only reason that this guy, this neutron star, of like a diameter of 10-12 kilometers only, that that is not collapsing under its own gravity, that is due to the Pauli principle. The fact that the two neutrons cannot be on top of each other, so uh, that gives it a finite size. So the very fact that these guys even are stable, that is due to power pressure. 
But as you can imagine, these neutrons are very close together, so they must interact quite strongly with each other. It's not a non-attracting Fermi gas. And yes, it is a very complicated beast. In fact, people believe that in the core of a neutron star, you have actually a superfluid of quarks. The density is so high now that you, know, you have rather a gas of, of uh, uh, free quarks that are actually also paired up and form a weird color superfluid. Of course, we have a hard time getting there to figure it out. Um, that's the problem. Yeah. You can make use. So now to understand uh, uh, scheduling and interactions between atoms, uh, let me see, I mean, I don't want to bore people, but uh, who has taken some kind of scattering theory in quantum mechanics to... Yeah, that is a majority. I'll quickly go then. Through, yeah, I, I think you should sure. skip go through that. I will, I will. I will not like suddenly yeah. <laughs> flip across 10,000 pages because it's important to be on the same page. Right. Exactly. And maybe I'm, I use different notations. Exactly. And you should never underestimate the pleasure at hearing things we already know. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and to be honest, this stuff is, you know, for me always very confusing. You know, so, so I myself have to periodically go back and really think about what's going on in scattering. Recently we were thinking about what happens in two dimensions, so I had to, so to speak, almost relearn everything I, I, I thought I knew from three dimensions, go to 2D, figure the whole thing out again. So it's good to go through it uh, 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 as often as possible. Uh, if you have in, in quantum mechanics uh, uh, a scattering potential, here V of R, it's, I just denoted by a dot, but it could be some extended weird thing. Uh, what happens to an uh, incoming plane wave that are sent onto this obstacle? That's the question that scattering theory hopefully can answer. I come in with a plane wave E to the i k z, which so is a wave vector k. It's propagating along the z direction <coughs> and it has some um, frequency omega. <coughs> what happens is, of course, that this potential here will scatter this wave into all kinds of outgoing waves. And far away from the potential, where I can neglect the potential effect, it's going to be a spherically, it will look like a spherically outgoing wave, multiplied by uh, this interesting factor, the scattering amplitude, that can have some interesting uh, complicated uh, structure as a function of the angle in which I scatter. Could be a mess, right? Yeah. It'll be a mess uh, if I have some complicated weird potential that scatters my wave into all kinds of weird uh, directions. And if I'm not at low temperatures, luckily I'm at low temperatures, and uh, I only have so-called S-wave collisions. I, uh, S wave means essentially head-on collisions. There is no angular momentum involved. There is no problem with any kind of structure, any any dependence on the angle theta and phi in the scattered wave. The scattered wave will look like an innocent or more innocent spherically outgoing wave with just the parameter f in front that does not depend on the angles, theta and phi. So it's a beautifully spherically outgoing wave with no structure as I look left and right. Okay. So that's what happens uh, for S wave. Now, when, when can I use the S wave limit? Gee, I should maybe just ask you. Oh, I can ask you. <laughs> Low temperature, exactly. Um, now, uh, if my potential has a certain range r, it turns out this S wave limit I can use when I can no longer resolve the intricacies of this potential of size of range r, big r. Right? That means I have to have waves, the Broglie waves with a wavelength much larger than the range of that potential r. That is like I'm using, uh, that there's totally equivalent to, to using light with a given wavelength lambda, and I'm trying to look at something which is much, much smaller than lambda. I will not be able to resolve that super small thing, like an atom, for example. We all say, oh, the size of an atom is roughly given by the Bohr radius. Well, I'm not going to see the Bohr radius if I scatter uh, light of this atom with the wavelength that this atom likes, for example, yellow light for sodium atoms, my wavelength is much too large. I don't see the intricacies. In that case, I'm in this S wave 
regime, I don't have enough energy to have any angular momentum in, in my scattering process. That would cost me, for atom atom scattering, would cost me h bar squared over m r squared, where r is the size of the potential. That's roughly how much it would cost me to, to have a p-wave collision. So that's not going to happen, and that's why I can restrict myself to s-wave collisions. Okay, so, so what now happens uh, uh, with these two waves that we add together? We have this incoming plane wave, we have the radially outgoing work wave. So the total wave function is the sum of these two, and I can write it in this s-wave limit as um, something like a superposition of in and outgoing radial waves. That makes sense, I mean, this, this e to the ikz plane wave, in fact, far away, it just looks like a radially is fairly symmetric radially outgoing wave, once I'm no longer able to see the curvature of my plane wave, which will actually be zero. And I can write it as 1 over r times sine instead of e to the, I can write it as sine of kr plus this phase shift delta here, which depends on the momentum that I sent onto my potential. And there's, of course, a relation between this f and this delta, it's just math. I can write it down. Relation is something not so illuminating. The point is that without any interaction, delta is zero. I have the, 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 this, this uh, the scattering doesn't do anything to my uh, uh, wave function. It's just sine kr over r. But if I have some interaction, then I have a finite phase shift delta. And so that's the only thing that happens at low temperatures. It's just a phase shift of my wave function. It's very, very beautiful and simple. Now, what causes these interactions between two atoms? First of all, two atoms, I can boil it down to this problem that I had just on the wall by just saying, well, I can go to the, uh, I, can, I can divide the problem into the center of mass motion of the two atoms and the relative motion of the two atoms, which then has this beautiful interatomic potential uh, for, for the scattering of the two atoms. That is, in our real world, given by uh, a Van der Waals potential at large distances from the fluctuating dipoles, is attractive minus C6 over R to the 6. And at very short range, we have a repulsion because the electron clouds of the two atoms don't want to penetrate each other. So it roughly looks like that. It has a given size, given roughly by, uh, by what we call the Van der Waals range, which is just given by the mass of the particles, h bar, and the C6 coefficient. <coughs> and it turns out this, this radial size is uh, for typical alkali, and it's always on the order of, let's say, 100 Bohr radii, 100 A0. So, it's actually uh, something like 50 nanometer or so. It's much, much smaller than the de Broglie wavelength that we achieve when cooling these gases down to pretty much absolute zero, <laughs> very close to absolute zero. Our de Broglie waves can be microns, and then we, have, we don't have to worry about P wave or higher angular collisions. It's going to be in the S wave regime. So, check, we have S wave collision globally. That's great. Uh, they, the atoms are not able to probe the intricacies of the potential. Now that's great because you can forget everything I said about this Van der Waals potential. Um, you can say like, wait a second, the atom doesn't see this. Um, it will, of course, the, 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 the uh, um, relative wave function for the two atoms will have some crazy craziness going on here. But far away from the potential, it's just going to look like sine kr plus delta with some phase shift delta. That's the only thing that can happen at low temperatures in the S-wave regime. So let's just get rid of this complicated potential replaced by something that we love, the square rail potential. And that should be fine. As long as I tune the properties of my square rail with rather small size r uh, to have the same phase shift as the phase shift that I got from my Van der Waals potential, I'm totally fine. I have the absolute equivalent problem. There's at these low temperatures. It doesn't matter how the potential is shaped. We have the problem that is much larger than the potential. Uh, there is this wonderful parameter called the scattering length. Equivalent to the phase shift, it's actually given by the tangent of the phase shift divided by k. Which looks like a terrible formula, but here it is. It's nothing else than the zero crossing 
of that sine kr plus delta function, which you can construct by just taking the tangent on the sine kr function. Uh, if, you, if you take the limit of extremely low momentum scattering, this sine kr actually just looks like a line which goes all the way and comes back maybe 10,000 meters away. As you take that slope, see where it crosses zero, that point is the scattering plane. So that describes the interatomic interactions at low temperatures convenient. Now let's look at what happens to that scattering length as a function of this potential well. Uh, here uh, I show, well, an attractive potential well, and the beginning of the sine kr wave function, but I'm zooming in so much and I have such low momentum that I'm not seeing that this is actually a sine wave function. It's mostly like just a line. Right? But the interatomic potential has managed to bend this sine kr so much that it looks like as if it originates from negative distances. It looks like that. That means A, the scattering length is negative. We have just some little bit of an attractive web on it. This is how, how, how it can look like. You can just do this in mathematics. It's a lot of fun. Um, this is a very tiny attractive potential. It bends the wave function so much that outside the range of the potential looks like that, this, that the wave function is coming from negative radio. And for this uh, attractive potential, the scattering length, yes, it becomes negative. Now you can imagine as you pull on this square well more and more, it will make the scattering length more and more negative as the potential is able to bend this wave function more and more. And now something dramatic happens. At some point, the potential was able to bend the wave function so much that now actually the sine kr looks like as if it originated from positive distances. The scattering length has now become positive. And in between there is this dramatic resonance where the scattering length has gone through the roof, it has diverged. That is simply when the wave function uh, was bent so much that right outside the potential it looks like a straight horizontal line. That means the scattering length, well, you cannot say, is it at minus infinity, is it at plus infinity? That's an interesting resonant regime. Okay, we can follow more what happens when we pull more on this potential. We get, at some point, uh, we, we can bend the wave function so much that again, it looks like the wave function arrives, um, originates from negative uh, radii. Um, the scattering length changes sign, goes to negative values, and then we bend it even more. Now it looks like it comes from positive values again. So that's what happens with uh, this square wave potential. You get the succession of resonances where the scattering length changes sign. So here is a summary of this. Uh, we get tunable interactions by varying the interaction strength between spin up and spin down atoms. So, what I mean by spin up and spin down, I have been said. Uh, uh, I told you that we cannot have any interactions between only uh, spin polarized Fermi gas of red guys. But if I take another spin state of fermions, say the blue guys, those have no problem with scattering because they are distinguishable by their spin. So those guys I need if I want to have scattering between my fermions. Um, let's see what happens. Weak attraction gives me uh, no bound state. The wave function, as we realized, looks like as if it was originating from negative uh, radii. Now here is this resonant effect that I mentioned, where the potential has, to, has managed to bend the wave function so much that it looks like the wave function originated from negative infinity or plus infinity. It's, it's a resonance. And there's a very cute thing that happens. First, this is already what you know. The wave function is bent so much that now the scattering rate is positive. But there's something else. Now I have here a negative slope right outside my potential. That means I can also continue this wave function I can outward integrate my Schrodinger equation with a negative energy that gives me a bound state. That actually turns out to be simply possible. And in that case, where I have a positive scattering length, I will always also get a bound state that is directly related to the scattering length. Turns out it will be given by h bar squared over the mass over the scheduling length squared. That's the bound state energy for this interesting 
bound state ring function. We will come back to bound states. Good question. Yeah. Uh, I just want to make sure that I'm following this. So the, the scattering is between fermions of different spins? Yes. So, and, so uh, uh, a little bit of apologies. First, I was talking about some, just some two atoms scattering off each other. I didn't even say whether they're fermions or, or, or bosons. We did realize, though, that if we have two fermions, which have absolutely the same spin state, you know, they both, both look red, we actually cannot have S-wave collisions, because they cannot be in a symmetric wave function and also have symmetric spin wave function. That's not allowed. They have to have a totally anti-symmetric wave function. So what we can do is we can take a spin up and a spin down fermion, red and blue. Now the spin wave function is anti-symmetric, which means now the scattering wave function can be symmetric, which you have in S-wave scattering. That was a little bit of a jump. Okay, so now important for main body physics, which will give us fermion pairing, which will give us superfluidity, etc., is the ratio now of the scattering things, this interesting scattering parameter, and the interparticle distance. Now, we, we call that ratio the particle distance by, uh, divided by scattering, that is simply 1 over kf a. 1 over kf, remember, it's just the interparticle distance. Scat a is the scattering. So this is a very important parameter which tells us whether interactions are gas are strong or weak. Now comes the amazing norm that we have in the lab. We can actually tune the interactions. Unfortunately, we cannot just pull at the square well potential depth. You know, that's not going to happen. We will not be able to modify the Van der Waals potential in a, in a very crazy way and pull in more and more bound states. We'd have to have some tremendous electric fields. Um, there are ways to play with that. Here's the, the simple norm. It's called Feshbach resonances. This is the, the story that we had before. We had here a Van der Waals potential, and the particle describing these two particles, scattering, comes in and out, and the only thing that happens is a phase shift. That's for, that's, uh, uh, that, that would be, for example, for two particles that have their uh, electron spin aligned, they would scatter in what's called the triplet potential, it turns out. You know, there is a difference between whether uh, the, the two atoms have the electron spin aligned or anti aligned, you get two different potentials for the exotomic potential, triplet and single. This is the triplet potential. Now, there is also this single potential where the uh, electron spin is anti symmetric. Up down, actually, up down minus down. Uh, now, usually you don't probe this single potential because, well, you come in it as triplet, right? So we will never see this blue potential here. But let's say if there was a bound state here in this single potential, and second if, if there is a coupling that actually does make you turn from the triplet into a single, then you might probe the single potential for a while until you realize, wait a second, my energy is actually not correct to populate that bound state, I have to leave again. I will not be able to spend here a long time. There is a huge energy in tuning, so, so that is not going to happen. But still, if there is this coupling between singlet and triplet, I will be able to spend some time in this bound state. Luckily, there is this coupling. Any idea what that coupling might be? What flips the spin of the electron? Would also right, right. It's correct. <laughs> what can I say? What can I say? It's correct. Yeah. There are actually Feshbach resonances that are called were caused by a weak dipole dipole interaction. I mean a stronger interaction usually, which happens, you know, between electron spin and something else. A magnetic field, a specific magnetic field. That caused by the nuclear spin. Yeah. So there is uh, there is what we love and call the hyperfine interaction, which is written as s dot i. Right? It mixes electron and nuclear spin. So yes, I can jump into the single potential, uh, giving up an electron spin, flipping an electron spin by also turning a nuclear spin. 
So that hyperfine interaction would be able to give me the coupling to the single potential. Great. So now I have a coupling. I can go here. Uh, but now so what? It's still far away here in energy. It's not going to be resonant. I'm not going to have any, any fun there. Well, let's just tune the magnetic field. If I tune a magnetic field in my lab, what will happen is that the triplet potential, where the two electrons are, the, the two electrons by two atoms are spin aligned, they will move up and down with the Zeeman energy, with two bomb magnets on Earth. Um, which means this should be two. Okay, well, whatever the uh, difference in the magnetic moment. The single potential, but that doesn't do anything with the applied magnetic field, so it stays put. So at the given magnetic field, magically, I can manage to make my atoms resonant with this bound state, to be absolutely in resonance with the bound state of the single potential. That's where a resonance happens. Question. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the truth of state, I mean, this hyperfine coupling must be small when it's in this triplet state. I mean, the contact term with the nucleus... Uh, it, it's small. It's given... The, the order of magnitude is really just the hyperfine interaction of the atom. So in lithium-6, you can give a number to it. It's like H times 228 megahertz, for example. That's, that's exactly the, the hyperfine interaction. But there's a hyperfine split in between the uh, F states in, in, in lithium. And, well, it's small on the scale of this picture, <laughs> where I have the Van der Waals equation, which is electron volts, and it's ridiculous. But if, I have, uh, if I'm lucky, and I have a bound state that, that zero field is not too far away from the energy of, of my colliding, <coughs> then already a small-ish magnetic field of a few hundred gauss will bring that into resonance. So the only thing I have to then, then, then do is, is, uh, is turn my magnetic field and make the delta mu b roughly on the order of the distance to the uh, exactly on the order of the dis distance to this um, state. Then they will be in resonance, and the coupling will be provided by the hyperfine energy. So, are the Zeeman and hyperfine terms included in constructing the potentials? Or ah, that's a very good question. Uh, in my picture here, this is just concerning the um, the. Uh, orbital uh, potential, but taking into account whether the electron spin is singlet or triplet. So it's not taking into account the hyperfine interaction, which you should do, then you get, of course, coupled potentials yeah. for either of the incoming hyperfine states. Yeah. So this is a, a picture before switching on the hyperfine interaction. We can also see it here. There is no interesting uh, resonance happening here. The state just goes through. So it's in... Um, without internal structure. You need, uh, as far as I know, you need uh, two potentials that you can tune, tune with respect to each other, singlet and triplet, and the hyperfine is the strongest that can give you that. Yeah, that's what I thought. So we do that. Uh, you need for strong fish barriers. I'm, I'm a bit, uh, I don't want to say that it's not possible to have some weird other type of sketching resonance. If you don't have the same thing, I'm just not asking would they be still tunable with a magnetic field then? Uh, well, if you have a you can get scattered differential right? magnetic moment between the, the two potentials that we are considering, then, then yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me say one thing about this graph, which of course now, now, now should come in the, the second graph. The second picture. These two states. This is the molecular state, and here comes the atomic state. I have shown that, that they're not coupled at all. That's of course not true. Now I have to switch on the hyperfine interaction. Uh, you might be inclined to say, oh, two body, a two, two level system, I know how to do that. You know, it's just going to be this guy bends over like this, and the molecular state bends over like this. Oh, and then it comes this state. Turns out that's not quite true because um, if you look at it, the incoming energy, uh, the, 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 uh, the scattering states of the atoms, that's just not one state, that's many states. And this discrete molecular state couples to a continuum of states. Um, let me make another, another drawing. 
uh, where I do flip a couple of signs, maybe you don't notice, then it's fine. If you don't notice, don't do that. Uh, here, I draw all the energy states of my scattering particles. I can have any kind of momentum, right? So I, I will have a, a continuum of scattering states. I could call them K. Uh, and here, I have my molecular state. And this would be the uncovered picture, which we'll just go, go right through, nothing would happen. But it turns out, if you now switch on the coupling between this molecular state and this continuum, you don't just get some avoided crossing, which would then merge with zero energy at infinity. It's not the case. You will get a crossing at some finite distance away from the uncoupled uh, state. Here will be the, the point where the molecular state indeed really crosses the, uh, touches the, the continuum of energy states. Um, and well, if you were able to zoom in and see that correctly, each of these little little states would actually do a little bit of a, of a jump. Each of these momentum states would all go a little bit up, shifted up by this molecular state that comes up. And this is maybe a detail. On the other hand, it tells you why there is a Feshbach resonance not at infinity, right? Which you would expect from a two-level system, but actually at a finite magnetic field, uh, which would be here, be not. That's where really the molecular state cross touches the continuum. And over here, that is B0 star, that would have been the Feshbach resonance if the coupling was minute uh, on the scale. And this shift, of course, that delta B here, that is related to the hyperfine interaction. That is given by the hyperfine interaction of the, um, of the uh, gas and, and other details. I could actually probably give one talk on the Feshbach resonance. Um, <laughs> Oh, and I'm, I lost something very important. Which is this one. Okay, so it's an amazing, amazing knot that we love, and I wouldn't be here without that knot. There's another question. Can you use the other spin triplets, for instance, up down plus down up state? Right, yes. You can have fresh parents between all kinds of states. Right? That would also be, your, your example would also be coming in in the triplet potential, right? Um, and it turns out if you just rotated your, your XYZ world into the X direction, the up, down, plus, down, up would also just look, look like up, up in the X direction, right? So it's just a triplet again, and it would again couple to the same. Freshman resonance is amazing. A knob in the lab gives you interactions. Uh, let me just show you, you know, just a little bit you know, to calm down and uh, get a feel for what's going on. Let's do a fun experiment that shows you the power of these fresh power resonances. I call it the little Fermi Collider. Because what we do is we take the uh, spin down gas and the spin up gas of fermions, all these are fermions, and we just smash them into each other. And, uh, well, you could call that in a fancy way, from magnetism, where you have domains of spin ups and spin downs, to hopefully eventually superfluidity when they are on top of each other and pair up. Well, that's the story for the uh, rest of the talk. But let's just see what happens if you smash them into each other. Uh, what, what do we do, actually? We, uh, to prepare this gas, uh, we mix, cool the gas, and then we give a kick, preferentially to the spin-downs, and not so much to the spin-ups, so that they part. Yeah? And then we can rush through the flash bar resonance and let them collide into each other because they're still in this harmonic trap that confines them. Okay, so here we have a picture of our camera. Of course, the atoms in reality, they're next to each other. So this cloud is, of course, here. It's just two pieces of our CCD camera. One looks at the spin ups, the other looks at the spin downs. The total optical density is, is this guy, and the difference optical density is, is then this guy. And uh, let's train our eyes on the case where we don't have any interactions between the two guys. So here I have a movie. Uh, the top shows just the density difference. So you could look at that. Or you look at the bottom, which encodes also the total density in how dark each pixel is. Right, so it's a little bit fancier way of uh, showing this, this data. Um, let's just run the movie. 
It's amazingly boring. It's beautiful. It's beautiful, but boring. What have we done? We have tuned the scheduling links to zero, that, zero, nothing. No interaction. So what happens? These guys just fly through each other. The, uh, well, the, uh, the red guys fly through the blues, and here's the, 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 the frames of the movie. The red guys beautifully flow through the green, uh, through the blues without scattering at all. So it looks very beautiful, but it's actually no interaction. So nothing is happening. So what? Uh, I, I have a question. So, so the come on, come back. <laughs> so why do the the why does the size of the of the of the sample seem to be shorter? I mean, stretches and uh, and. The compresses, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, you, you might mean that here it looks like shorter. Right. <laughs> That's because we're looking at the density difference. So if I had caught the gas, for example, here, in the moment where they're pretty much overlapped, I, I don't see anything. I right? understand. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's right, it looks awesome, but it doesn't mean anything. I mean, that don't no, it looks awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so comments matter people would love this. You have a spin current that is not damped. Hooray, we can do spin tronics. Right. In cold atoms, this is maybe the boring limit when you don't have any interactions. Now, of course, let's go to the flash bar resonance and see what happens. We again smash these guys into each other, but now with interactions as strong as quantum mechanics allows, the scattering length has diverged. Uh, and, uh, well, the movie is cooler than this. Uh, this is not really cool. <laughs> Here comes the uh, movie, Shabam. Yeah. Right? They smash into each other and bounce off each other. Pretty ridiculous because these gases are a million times thinner than air and they actually bounce off each other. That's quite cute and shows you, wow, there must be a huge interaction strength here. And it's not because I have some crazy, huge, wonderful potential suddenly. No, it's just the quantum mechanical phase shift that is now resonant. Yeah? There is is the, the, the interactions are still super, super uh, short range. The M's don't see that short range. But the wave function is shifted as much as you can get it on resonance. It's pi over 2. That's the phase shift. They no longer look like a sine kr <coughs> that sees nothing here at zero distance. It looks like a cosine kr that sees everything that happens at zero distance. So that's what happens here. Okay, that's the bounce as a, uh, in, in terms of the frames of the movie uh, showing the, the bounce. Um, it looks rather dramatic. The total density is shown here, but you see that in the overlap region, they really pile up to some huge mountain of density because they really don't want to penetrate into each other. They have to collide so much. Mm. We, in fact, at later times, we see more and more of these bounces because they come back. They're still sitting in this harmonic trap, so they come back and bounce a couple of times. And, uh, uh, but then, as you, as you see, wow, it actually takes a long, long time, about one second, until they eventually merge and become one overlapping cloud. So it's, that is actually quite amazing. It takes them forever to merge. You would have said, like, a dilute gas it should take no time to merge, but here it takes forever. Mm -hmm. um, when they come together, do they communicate and flip and then... Ah, that's, that's, that's a good question. The, the interactions are uh, uh, S-wave and only between spin up and spin down, which means they also leave as spin up and spin down. It does not rotate their spin. So it's interaction, it's a singlet interaction only between up down minus down up guys, and that doesn't change the spin. But the total spin is still the same, they both flip. This is actually true. Well, maybe I'll. Uh, um, um, how can I say it uh, differently? The, the uh, interaction does not cause a spin rotation between the two guys because uh, um, if you picture the Bloch sphere, one guy is down, the other guy is up. Yeah? When they interact, nothing will happen because this guy is effectively not, not, uh, 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 not producing any effective magnetic field about, this, um, about which this guy could be able to. To, to rotate, for example. If I start on the left side with a superposition state, 
Up, down, pass, down, up, for example. That would be this guy on the North Street. And I collided with a spin-up. Now, something beautiful will happen. Actually, they will rotate about their common axis, turns out. And so both of their spins will actually change. The, the up guy will no longer be up, and the X guy will no longer be X after the collision. So, so that's fancy. I haven't done that yet. Okay. But that would be, would be cute to, to see. Mm -hmm. So just a technical question. It looks like you have no problem at all with three-body collisions, right? Ah, that's wonderful. <laughs> question, of course. Uh, usually, when Feshbach resonance were first discovered, it was in bosons. Um, so they saw, okay, the scattering length diverges is great, you can do it in directions, but unfortunately also hell breaks loose. Yeah? Because now that the um, interaction is so strong, uh, the, the atoms actually feel, uh, uh, for, feel most of the time this uh, deep interparticle potential with all these bound states. They are dangerous. However, for two particles scattering, it's actually not dangerous at all because they can never populate these molecular states and again and, 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 get, and con conserve energy and momentum conservation. That doesn't work. But if a third guy comes along, the third guy can collide with the two others. The two others are promoted into a molecular state. Third guy leaves with all kinds of energy and momentum, and both these pieces, like all these three guys, are just gone. It's terrible. That's three body collisions. And unfortunately, it is happening very rapidly for bosons. It takes like a millisecond or that or, or, or so for the, for the loss at the Feshbach resonance of the boson hydrogen condensate. You put it there, it's gone. Yeah. It's very sad. So people said for, for quite a while, oh, Feshbach resonance are terrible, it's a bad, bad idea. But unfortunately, it doesn't work. Fermions, it's magical. Why is it magical? Because of how I have spin down and spin up in my gas. And now let's check out what would happen in the three body collision. A third guy would have to come along. But that third guy is either spin up or spin down. And so that process is suppressed by the Pauli principle because that third guy will be Pauli excluded by the other guy that's already spin down. No, no, I was, I was. So, so that's why the uh, three body losses are minute and almost negligible. We can have this gas live for tens and tens of seconds. Yeah, that's the, really, that was the point that, uh, which, which brought my question. You, you here have one second, which is amazing. I would have thought you would have a little bit of, of P waves already coming in. <laughs> P waves scattering. But, but it doesn't even happen over this case. That's amazing. P wave scattering um, don't have any. is anyway suppressed because it's very low temperature. Yeah, yeah but, but we still have a little bit, right? Well, okay. Um, that's just uh, That's not a problem, right? If, if you have P wave interaction between spin up and spin down, or spin up and spin up, sorry, spin up and spin up, I should say, it would be fine. It would thermalize the gas a little bit. The contributions are very small because this P wave threshold is about a milli Kelvin. Right. So it really, really doesn't, doesn't happen. But the three body collisions, they could kill this, but they don't. Right. And the gas lives actually for tens of seconds. It's amazing. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's why we are in business. <laughs> Without Pauli, we would not be in business. Yeah. And something terrible happened here. Just um, you just went to sleep. Maybe. And here it is again. Oh, that's <laughs> would you say something about the two time scales? Uh, well, uh, the bounces. Um, would you say something about the two time scales? I don't want to say something about the two time scales. <laughs> I will not say something about the two time scales. Um, you're, you're saying, you know, there's one time scale for the stuff to leak into the, into the, uh, right, yeah. into the other cloud and then the other time scale. Uh, I think microscopically they are related by one and the same thing, the scattering between spin ups and spin downs, uh, but there might be a slightly different prefactor in healing this acceptation, this, this spin that acceptation. Uh, it's fine. It's not a problem. <laughs> because here's, here's um, uh, one thing. Here the gas is, for the most part, non-attracting in these regions, and the scattering is going to be placed in this small interaction region here, where they are actually already overlapped. And then they overlap more and more, and this microscopic scale should actually slow down quite a bit, because they scatter now more and more and more. And, and um, that might be one reason for the change in this, in this time scale. There is no simple model that explains this, this experiment. People are trying to simulate this. 
Vaughn. These residents have a width, and I was wondering if does what you is what does what you just said about both of apply if you if you're not on residence, but you're um, somewhere where the cost section is higher but not infinite. Right. So you can definitely do experiments with bosons close to a fish park residence, and for uh, if you tune your residence not. Um, tune your scattering length not quite to infinity, but to something like a little bit weaker. You might still be able to do very good experiments that where you can still say, okay, so this is roughly in equilibrium still. I can take a picture before, maybe ten times later, and help it But that. no matter what, if you're getting close to resonance, you're increasing three body three body losses, right? When you get close to resonance, they, they increase and increase and increase. Uh, uh, go some like some power of the scattering. Just, what is this high frequency stuff? Uh, oh, yeah, I zoomed out. So, so this is the early times uh, where you see bounce, 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 bounce. Collect the bounces, and that happens. That dies off after like 150 milliseconds or so. And then uh, here I zoom out. These are the bounces, bounce, 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 right? And then there's the long time scale evolution where they just slowly diffuse into each other. No, no, I thought about that spikiness. Of yeah, I think there's a confusion. You're plotting the actual pictures, okay. early, and then you stop plotting. I see. Pictures. Yeah, I show the pictures yeah, because I love them. Uh, and here I was lazy to put by hand the pictures onto the dots, and I was like, oh, this is terrible. <laughs> okay, stop, stop doing that. <laughs> also, it turns out we didn't have so much data so to, to make you know, the, the density equal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but here are some pictures. <laughs> here's one at 100 milliseconds. Here's one at 500 milliseconds where you see the two guys are still not overlapped. That's how strong the interactions are. It takes forever for the two guys to diffuse through each other. So while describing the flash bar resonance, we talked about the triple channel and the single channel. Mm -hmm. Whereas in this case, we have spin polarized atoms and we have a spin state which is up and down, a combination of the triplet and the signal. Yes. I'm, I'm so so mean, I always fall into that trap. Because I told you about single to triplet, with which I made electron single to triplet. But now I talk about spin up and spin down. What's going on? I don't know why I didn't have that slide there. It should be there. Here's the, here's the thing. Um, lithium, six. lithium 6 has all kinds of spin states, all kinds of fiber states. Here's the magnetic field, here's the energy. Uh, what states do we have to worry about? Well, we have an alkali atom, so S, the total S of the atom will be one half, that's fine. But we also have a nuclear spin, which is one. So that can make uh, F, the S plus I, equals to one half or to three halves. Okay. So I know, we get field, here, we get field, we get two states. Here, F equals one half. Here, F equals three half. And now, as I crank up the magnetic field, that there will be two stretch states where electron and nuclear spin are aligned, those two guys, yeah. electron and nuclear spin are either aligned or anti aligned in the magnetic field, those have a slope of one more magneton, that's it. And then I can, can fill in the dots at that uh, low fields, I get this beautiful nice linear thing, this guy would be one half more magneton minus one half more magneton. And high fields, though, this guy bends up and catches up to the, to the one more magneton guy because now I have such high fields that my electron and nuclear spin are decoupled, and I have these two guys going down. And here's a third guy that's also going down. Um, this guy is always going to go down because it's a stretch state. If it's one half splits into two, and then at high fields, it goes down. Yeah. And, and these three guys go down. This is an amazing picture. Mathematica does the job. At high fields, you have two manifolds one for electron spin up, one for electron spin down. And three sub guys here, which correspond to the different orientations of the nuclear spin. For example, here, this guy was a stretch state, so it has to have minus one. This guy will have zero, and this guy has plus one orientation of the nuclear spin with respect to the magnetic field. We love to use these two states. We call them state one and state two of the field. We sometimes also call them spin up and spin down even though that word spin is really a pseudo-spin. Yeah? It's just a two-level system, and you say spin up is that guy, and spin down is that guy. But it is not related to what the electron spin is. 
Turns out that electron spin is actually pretty much the same at high fields. The electron spin is both uh, in the same direction, which is why they're both going down with increasing magnetic field. So they do collide in the triplet potential of the isotopic potential, the electron spin line, and they flip over to the single potential. Um, it's confusing. Why do you choose those two particular states? Ah, oh, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> one and two have this wonderful Feshbaum resonance at 834 Gauss in lithium 6. By the way, one and three are also awesome. They have a resonance at 690 Gauss, pretty as much as, you know, as useful, it's great. And two and three also. Makes kind of sense. All these guys that look pretty much similar, right? They only are diff different in energy by a little bit. So if these guys have a resonance, these guys have a the width in, in terms of magnetic field is about 300 gauss. Okay. So you can just, you know, without any magnetic field stabilization, just go there and sit at 834 gauss, fine. Um, I'm doing awesomely on time. This is a lie. Okay. <laughs> uh, here, here, a quick explanation of what we just saw. We have this very, very slow diffusion. And that comes about simply due to the uh, scattering between spin-up and spin-down particles. There is no spin-up, spin-up scattering, because that would be forbidden by the Pauli principle. The ups cannot be colliding in S wave, we discussed that. Down-down is also forbidden, so there's only up-down collisions. However, we are at the Feshbach resonance. So the scattering cross-section is actually um, as large as it can possibly be. It's given by the characteristic wavelength of the particles scattering, square, uh, scattering cross sections, of course, a square of a length. That length is not the scattering length anymore, which would be true in small scattering length, but here the scattering length has, has diverged. So the only thing that, that survives as a length scale is actually the de Broglie wavelength. And for fermions, the characteristic de Broglie wavelength is, well, coming from KF, the interparticle spacing. So the scattering cross-section is given by the interparticle spacing squared. That immediately tells you also one thing, the mean free path, which is 1 over n density times sigma, is just given by 1 over kf, the interparticle spacing. That means these guys have to collide at every encounter. The spin up means the spin down, bam, it has to collide. And another time, and another. And whenever a spin down means a spin up, it has to collide, which is very different from uh, a typical gas with weak interactions where you can have a mean free path which is like meters or whatever while the interparticle distance is still, is still microscopic. Here they have to collide every encounter. Such a situation is called sometimes a perfect limit. And, and now if you figure out you know, how often do they scatter, the fancy term is spin drag coefficient, but you can just think about it as being the collision rate. At n sigma v, the characteristic velocity is just given by the Fermi momentum, that's h bar kf over m, that would be the Fermi velocity plane, that is given by the Fermi energy over h bar. So it's very fast, the Fermi energy is a very large energy scale over h bar, gives you a very large rate. It's actually as fast as it can possibly be. And now if you figure out the diffusion coefficient in this weird uh, spin down, spin up mix, that would be calculated as the mean free path squared per collision time or equivalently the mean free path times the average velocity with which they scatter. It turns out 1 over kf from the mean free path cancels with h bar kf over m from the average velocity, and you're left with h bar over m, a diffusion constant which only depends on the mass of the particles. Turns out, I think, in an optical molasses, you do get a diffusion coefficient which also goes like that. It certainly has that in it, but it has other things. Sure, yeah, but this is sort of like quantum limit of right, the right. diffusion. Right, exactly. Yeah. So if you're kind of within gamma, also of the detail. Okay, so it turns out if you plug in the numbers for lithium 6, it is 100 microns squared per second, which is really giving us the right scale because the cloud size is 100 micron, and they take one second to diffuse into each other, so the scattering is, is very strong. Yay! Now, that's what we really want to figure out. Can Fermi gas actually become superfluid? 
We have now the interactions, we love that. Things have become very interesting already, but now can we make them superfluid? Well, we know that this is true, because electrons have this fantastic property that they can become superconducting at very low temperatures. So if you take some metal, uh, uh, like mercury, for example, and you cool it down, bam, uh, at about 4.2 Kelvin, you see, um, um, sorry, this is not mercury, um, quick, I don't see. Oh, and okay, I didn't see that. <laughs> Great. It bam goes down to pretty much unmeasurable resistances. Uh, I, I hear the, the lore that Kamari Honest first didn't believe that data when it came out of the lab. Might be a lore, but it's a good story. He fired the student, went down to the lab, remeasured it, figured out, oh, it's actually true. And uh, 1913, I think. But it took almost uh, 50 years, uh, 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 yes, almost 50 years, for um, the, the riddle to be explained. Why can these electrons do this, do this trick? And there was, of course, a huge story about how this was figured out. It was already clear at some point, oh, probably, maybe, Bose-Einstein condensation has something to do with it. But wait a second, electrons are not bosons, so maybe they have to form pairs to become bosons, right? And then they can condense, but wait, electrons repel like mad when they come close, so it cannot be tiny electron pairs, it has to be something very weird. And of course, these guys figured it out, Bardeen, Cooper, and, and Schrieffer, uh, figured out that these superconductors can indeed be described by charged superfluids of electron uh, pairs. And of course, frictionless flow that we know from the superfluid is nothing else than resistance is uh, current. Uh, this theory, of course, has been vastly successful way beyond Condens matter. Uh, for example, it describes what happens in a neutron star. It describes what happens in helium-3, but of course you have to always make modifications, etc. And uh, even though I don't know much about it, but I did, I, I'm told that it explains why I'm heavy, <laughs> why I have a mass. Uh, because, well, if you think about it, square root of mc, uh, n squared, c squared, uh, n squared c to the 4 plus p squared c squared, that looks like a BCS excitation spectrum, which we will learn to be uh, uh, something going like k squared plus the gap squared. So you can tell me that my mass is a gap. <laughs> I'm not qualified to talk about this, but you know, I hear that. Okay, um, so, so here's, the, here's the thing. Um, back to bosons versus fermions, we have seen uh, that bosons, uh, they contain so great. Strongly bound fermion pairs will also condense, so that's of course one way I can get a superfluid. And I immediately also know that I only need to cool to this degeneracy temperature that we learned already in 1995 how to reach. So that's great. So you have strong interactions between my fermions that form really tightly bound molecules. Great, that's fine. And of course, we can think of the hydrogen atom as being strongly bound uh, fermion pairs, right? Proton, electron, that works. Or sodium and sodium plus the ion and another electron that forms sodium, the yeah, the neutron atom. That's a fermion pair, or lithium six and lithium six, which will come up uh, in, the, uh, in the main of these uh, lectures. Uh, now on the other side here, where we have weak interactions, we have this interesting thing. We have fermions, we have spin up and spin down. We already know we need two spin up and spin down, otherwise we don't have any interactions. And we could ask whether there are any interactions for if I, have, if I have very weak interactions, if there are any pairs that might form. Um, because it turns out the interaction between two electrons in a, in a metal is rather weak once you subtract off the, 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 the Coulomb repulsion. That's done by the positive uh, background of the, of the ions. And if you look at what remains, it's actually weak interaction. Okay, so uh, let us just figure out a little bit what the interaction scales are. Um, here comes this fantastic word, mean field interaction energy. If an atom sits in a cloud of others with which it interacts, with a given scattering length A, this is the energy that it feels from this bath of others. So we have a spin down atom sitting in a bath of spin ups at density N. This is the so called mean field energy that it, uh, that it sees. My hand waving explanation has not improved from yesterday night. I would say that uh, the uh, fraction of volume 
where the spin out down atom feels the spin up gas, that is roughly given by the density of the spin ups times A cubed, uh, which gives you the idea of you know that's that's the, the volume that uh, would be excluded if A is positive. That's kind of the, the, the interaction uh, volume n times A cubed. But when the atoms live in this in this uh, kind of forbidden region, what energy would they feel? They would feel the energy of the bound molecular state, uh, h bar squared over m a squared. Did I ever tell you that? I, I fear I didn't. Um, whenever you have a positive scattering length, there is a bound state energy associated to that. I did tell you that the two are related, but I didn't tell you that formula. If the scattering length is positive, there is a bound state at h bar squared over m a squared. And now what I did is I just you know, uh, hand waved, I said N A cubed. Yeah. That gives me roughly the number of spin ups in the volume of A cubed, which is this spin down and is interacting with. And in that region in space, there is an energy shift that the spin up down at the fields, which is given by H bar squared over N A squared. Yeah. That's a characteristic energy. Once you have the length scale A, that's the greatest energy associated with that, and you get something that goes like uh, h bar squared over m and A. It's very amazing, but I love it. Um, that's the mean field interaction energy. So that's what a spin out and it feels that it lives in a spin up suit. Uh, is it a weak or a strong interaction? Well, let's see. Uh, com let's compare this mean field interaction to the Fermi energy. The Fermi energy was h bar squared kf squared over uh, 2m, right? So h bar squared is an m that goes away. And then you have na divided by kf squared. n is nothing else than kf cubed, so you're left with kfa. Great. Kfa, that's a number, that's nice. kf, that's the interparticle spacing, one of the interparticle spacing, which, well, depending on how dense your gas is, is 1 over 2000 a naught. The sketching length typically is 50 to 100 A naught without a fish bar resonance. If you're just left with your Van der Waals potential density, so K of A is a small number, smaller than 5%. So it's a weak interaction. Are we ever going to get superfluidity? Well, let's see. It's a, it's a weak interaction. Here's the hope. In superconductors, the electron phonon interaction is also weak. It's given by the Debye frequency. That's the uh, pretty much the highest frequency with which these lattice ions can vibrate, and it turns out that is actually important to mediate the interaction between two electrons. It's actually the lattice vibration that do that. That's given by an energy scale of 100 Kelvin times K divided by the Fermi energy, which is 10,000 of Kelvin. So that's a weak interaction, one percent. Okay, so that apparently still works for superconductivity, so we have to understand why that works. How can we have atom pairs with this terribly weak interaction? I think my time is up for this lecture. It's a very nice open question. Okay. This is it took 50 years to figure out the answer to that question, so maybe we can give you one night, two nights actually, <laughs> to ponder it. And uh, I, I guess that would be a good That's point. Perfect. Thank you so much. Fantastic lecture. Questions? Comments? Bill, I'm sure you have something. Well, I'm still unhappy about the separation <laughs> of time scales.